Hello, and welcome to another lecture on informal fallacies. Today we'll talk about weak inductive argument fallacies. <clears throat> so, the book divides weak inductive argument fallacies into two types, generalization fallacies and false cause fallacies. The, general, the generalization fallacy is making a generalization when it's not warranted. And we'll look at several examples of that. A uh, false cause fallacy, uh, a causal connection is assumed to exist between two events when none actually exists. So you're saying that A caused B when there is no causal connection between A and B. Okay, here are some examples of generalization fallacies. Rigid application of a generalization, hasty generalization, composition, division, and biased sample. We'll work through each one of those. So with the rigid application of a generalization, this is when a generalization or rule is inappropriate, inappropriately applied to the case at hand. The fallacy results from the unwarranted assumption that a generalization or a rule is universal, meaning it has no exceptions. Right, so you're, you're taking a generalization or a rule and you're saying that it applies in all cases without exception. And sometimes, you know, rules can be like that, but uh, other times they, they're not like that. And so to assume that they are like that when uh, they're not is to commit this sort of fallacy. So here's an example from the book. I can't believe the police didn't give the driver of that ambulance any citations. He was speeding, he went through a light, and the ambulance swerved from lane to lane without using any turn signals. Okay. So yes, it's a rule that you cannot speed, cannot um, blow through lights, and you can't swerve from lane to lane without using any turn signals. But this is not an exceptionless rule. You, you know, with ambulances, they can obviously break these rules, um, and uh, they meet the conditions uh, required uh, in order to be able to break these rules. And the police, rather than pull them over, will let them through. And they may even do that for, uh, you know, someone not driving an ambulance, some, someone driving a, a regular car. Um, if they're, if the person in the car is, is trying to get to uh, the hospital, the police may even give them an escort. Here's another example. Sarah said that female ducks lay eggs. She's wrong about that. I had a female duck that never laid a single egg in its lifetime. Okay, so this example uh, of um, the rigid application of a generalization stems from the fact that just because you say that ducks lay eggs or female ducks lay eggs, it doesn't mean that you're saying there's no exception to it. If you find a single duck, female duck, that doesn't lay eggs, it doesn't prove that the general principle or rule is false. Okay. So, note that some rules admit of no exceptions, so all bachelors are unmarried. You're, I don't care how hard you look, how long you look, you're not going to find a bachelor that's um, married. So it's, it's not a fallacy to say um, that there can't be a married bachelor. It's just part of the concept of being a bachelor that you're unmarried. But some generalizations are generic in that they admit of exceptions. And to apply such generic generalizations too rigidly, this is where the mistake comes in. So ducks lay eggs, children are shorter than adults, um, those sorts of things. They're generic uh, generalizations, and um, to say that you've to say that you've proven the um, generalization wrong by finding an exception is just to misunderstand the nature of generic generalizations. Then you have hasty generalization. This is a generalization created on the basis of just a few instances. So here's an example. All dolphins are good with kids. The other day at sea land, my daughter swam with a dolphin and it was very friendly. My brother's kids had the same experience with a dolphin at Sea Life Park. All right, so you're taking an interaction with two dolphins uh, and uh, 
uh, making a claim about all dolphins. Well, you saw that. These two dolphins behaved in a certain way, therefore all dolphins must behave in a certain way. You, well, you, that's too much. That's, um, you, you know, you've, uh, you've gone too fast there in, in saying that uh, because these two cases are like such and such, then all cases will be like such and such. So, uh, hasty generalization is an example of a certain type of, type of argument called argument by enumeration. This is to draw a general conclusion on the basis of li listing instances of that conclusion. So to draw a general conclusion on the basis of listing instances of that conclusion. So here's an example. Felix the dolphin is good with kids, Gwen the dolphin is good with kids, and Flipper the dolphin is good with kids. Therefore, all dolphins are good with kids. So you have, this is an argument by enumeration. You have the general conclusion that Dolphins are good with kids, and then you have instances that instances of that conclusion. Felix, Gwen, and Flipper, they're all good with kids. Now this one is hasty as well, um, but uh, it's still just it's supposed to exemplify um, argument by enumeration. So sometimes arguments by enumeration are strong. You know they're they're inductive. Um, there are I guess there are some arguments by enumeration that are deductive. Um, whenever you have, um, suppose you have the, uh, a, a class of objects and you list all the objects in the class and say that they all have this feature X, uh, and then you conclude that all of them have that feature X. Well, that's deductive because you've listed every single object in the class so you know there are no exceptions. But arguments by enumeration are typically inductive when you're you're not listing all of the objects in the class. You're you're listing a representation, a sample of the objects in the class, and then you're making a generalization about all the objects in the class. So sometimes these are weak inductive arguments. Sometimes they're strong. So not all arguments by enumeration are hasty or fallacious. Um, arguments by enumeration are hasty when just a few instances are listed. And the more instances one observes or lists, the more reliable is the generalization until you get, you know, um, a strong argument. Uh, so suppose you have, um, you know that there are only 100 swans in existence, and you've observed 95 of them, and you noticed all 95 swans that I observed, uh, they were all white. So therefore, uh, the other five that I haven't observed will be white as well. So this is a strong argument. Now, you could be wrong about it, of course, but that's just the nature of inductive arguments, that they don't guarantee their conclusion. But to list 95 out of 100 and see that they all have a certain feature, it's not irrational. It's, in fact, quite rational to say that, therefore, the ones that you haven't observed um, have that feature as well. But to list, you know, to have to know that there are a hundred swans in existence and to observe five of them and say these five swans that I have observed are, are uh, were white um, or are white and therefore um, the other 95 that I haven't observed will be white as well that's that's hasty okay then there's the fallacy of composition and there are two forms of it one is the mistaken transfer of an attribute of an individual of the individual parts of an object to the object as a whole, and two, the mistaken transfer of an attribute of the individual members of a class to the class itself. So with the first one, you're, you're, you're saying the parts of an object have a prop property, therefore the whole object will have the property. The parts of an object have a feature, therefore the whole object will have that feature. So here's an example. Each brick in the building is fairly light, so the building will be light. Well, of course not. Um, just because, you know, say the bricks each weigh six ounces, it doesn't mean that the entire building um, won't be that heavy or even that the entire building will weigh six ounces. You know, when you add them all up together, it's quite heavy and, and you're not able to lift it. Um, so that's an example of uh, transferring an attribute of the individual parts of an object to the object as a whole. You're saying the whole object has this property because each of the parts has that property. Here's an example of the second sort of mistake. 
More noise is produced by a motorcycle than by a car, therefore, more noise is produced on U.S. roadways by motorcycles than by cars. Okay, so even if it's true that more no noise is produced by a given motorcycle than by a given car, or um, every individual motorcycle is louder than any individual car, just because that's true, if it is true, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, taken together, uh, motorcycles produce more noise on U.S. roadways than cars taken together. Suppose there are only five motorcycles in existence, and each one of those motorcycles individually is noisier than any individual car. Well, suppose there are a million cars. Even if each individual motorcycle is noisier than each individual car, it doesn't mean that motorcycles produce more noise on U.S. roadways than cars. So the five motorcycles that there are uh, don't produce as much noise as the million cars that there are, supposing that, you know, they're all being driven on U.S. roadways. Okay. So you can see that just because, um, you know, an individual member of a class has a certain feature, it doesn't mean that the whole class has that feature uh, taken together. So note, though, that not all part-to-whole uh, arguments are fallacious. Not all part-to-whole arguments are fallacious. You can rightly argue that since every piece of my sewing machine is made from steel, it follows that my sewing machine is made from steel. Because, you know, like the, um, the hole is exhausted by the parts in this case. Um, and how do you distinguish a fallacious use of, um, part -to -whole, of a part-to-whole argument from a non-fallacious use of a part-to-whole argument? Well, you can't have a really general rule that would distinguish the fallacious from the non-fallacious. You just have to look at contact, context and your background knowledge. So, you know, given your background knowledge, you know that um, if every piece of a sewing machine is made from steel, the whole thing is going to be made from steel. This is just your knowledge of, um, uh, you know, the whole being exhausted by the parts. So then we have division. There are two forms of this fallacy. One is the mistaken transfer of an attribute of an object as a whole to the individual parts of the object. And two, the mistaken transfer of an attribute of a class to the individual members of the class. Okay, so you're taking, an, you're saying an object as a whole has this certain feature. Therefore, each part will have that feature. So look at this example I have of the, this first sort of mistake, that building is taller than me, so each of its parts must be taller than me. Obviously, it doesn't follow. Just because the building is taller than you, it doesn't follow that each of the parts is taller than you. Maybe they're each six inches tall and you're five feet tall, and the building's 2,000 feet tall, um, so it just doesn't follow. Then we have an example of the second sort of mistake. It's transferring an attribute of a class to the individual members of the class. Uh, here's our example. That fraternity celebrated its 50th birthday. A guy on my floor is a member of that fraternity, so he must have celebrated his 50th birthday as well. All right, obviously an error. But not all hold-to-part arguments are fallacious. Here's one that's not. That is a wooden chair, and I guess we'd have to define what we mean by a wooden chair. Um, and it might be that a wooden chair is composed of um, only wooden parts or that each of its major parts are wooden. So that is a wooden chair, so the legs are made of wood. So how do you distinguish the fallacy from the non-fallacy? Well, again, context and background knowledge um, will help. You can't have a general rule that really tells you when you're committing the fallacy and when you're not committing the fallacy. You just got to think it through, I suppose. Okay. Then there's the um, weak inductive fallacy of a biased sample. This is an argument that uses a non-representative sample as support, as support for a statistical claim about an entire population. So you might say, a survey of 100 seniors at our university showed that 90% do not oppose a parking fee increase 
that will go into effect next year. Therefore, we can report that almost all students do not oppose a parking fee increase. So you've, all you've done is you've surveyed seniors, and then you're making a claim about all the students at the university. Um, so in order for the sample to be representative, it has to be a mix of seniors, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and maybe even of various majors, biology, philosophy, um, whatever, um, English. Okay, so you need to have a representative sample in order to draw a conclusion about the entire population. Um, and here, the sample is not representative, so we aren't rational in drawing the conclusion about the entire population. I mean, unless there are only 101 students at the university, um, and 100 of them are seniors, but we're assuming that this is a large university. Suppose there are 20,000 students. Okay, so we've gone through um, the first set of uh, fallacies of weak induction. Now let's go through the second set, and these are false cause fallacies. There are two examples that the book gives, post hoc ergo proctor hoc and slippery slope, and we'll look at each of those in turn. So post hoc fallacy is, um, is it the, the long name is post hoc ergo proctor hoc, and that means after the fact, therefore, because of the fact. Um, and this occurs from the mistaken assumption that just because one event occurred after another event, that the first event must have caused the second event. So x occurred before y, therefore x caused y. And obviously, this, this doesn't follow. So uh, here's a silly example. Uh, Julius, Julius Caesar existed before me. Uh, therefore, Julius Caesar is the cause of my transmission trouble in my car. <laughs> um, so just because you know Julius Caesar came before me, it doesn't mean he has anything to do with my car trouble. Um, so to claim that uh, x occurred before y, therefore x caused y, is fallacious. And no, the, the key here is that you're claiming that there's a causal relationship simply because of the temporal relationship you're claiming that there's a causal relationship simply because there's a temporal relationship. A came before B, therefore A caused B. Okay, so now we have a real-life example. We did not have so many mass shootings until Obama became president. Therefore, Obama is responsible for the rise in mass shootings. And there's a little uh, a link there um, where they try to discuss why there have been more mass shootings under Obama than the four previous presidents. It's where I kind of got the example. Um, okay, so so the, I don't think that the argument that's being made in that article is as, is as simple, as sim simplistic as the example I give here on the screen. Um, but let's suppose that it is just that simple. Okay, so to claim that, you know, first there was a First, Obama became president, and then there was a rise in mass shootings. Therefore, Obama caused the rise in mass shootings. That's obviously post hoc ergo proctor hoc, because the only piece of evidence you're pointing to, which, again, I'm not saying the article only points to the temporal evidence, but the only piece of evidence you're pointing to in this example uh, that I give is, is the temporal order. A came before B, therefore A caused B. But it, that it just doesn't follow. In order to establish a causal relationship, sure, A is going to become A is going to have to come before B. But you're going to have to say more than just A came before B. You're going to have to point to really um, influences that A has on B. Okay, that was post hoc, ergo proctor hoc. Now we need to look at slippery slope. This is an argument that attempts to connect a series of occurrences such that the first link in a chain leads directly to a second link, and so on, until a final, unwanted situation is said to be the inevitable result. Don't, uh, don't smoke because um, you'll end up dead in the streets or something, and you, uh, you're claiming that that's the, uh, direct, the uh, inevitable result. It may not be the direct result. It may come after a series of 
events, uh, but they're all related to smoking. You know, that's the sort of claim that slippery slope is making. You know, don't don't uh, legalize marijuana because uh, then you know people are going to be then we're going to end up legalizing crack or something. You know, or uh, don't use marijuana because you'll end up as a, a crackhead. You know, um, these are all examples of the slippery slope argument. It's a fallacy because um, there isn't necessarily that sort of inevitable causal uh, chain leading from A to Z. Let me give you an example here. It's supposed to be funny. Oh, when you get angry, you will blow off steam. Let's start that over. When your cable company keeps you on hold, Accidents happen, you get an eye patch. When you get an eye patch, people think you're tough. When people think you're tough, people want to see how tough. And when people want to see how tough, you wake up in a roadside ditch. Don't wake up in a roadside ditch. Get rid of cable and upgrade to Direct TV. Call 1 800 Direct TV. All right, so there's a little commercial for you. Uh, get Direct TV. No, I'm not uh, endorsing Direct TV, obviously. Um, so yeah, so you're saying, I mean, this, this was just using like slippery slope fallacy for comedic effect and saying like if you um, do such and such, you're going to end up in a roadside ditch. Um, you don't want to end up in a roadside ditch, do you? Therefore, you should get direct TV. Um, but obviously, it's not the inevitable conclusion. Okay, so sometimes it's not a fallacy to claim that one event will inevitably lead to another event until a final unwanted situation comes about. Uh, here's an example. Uh, I mean, well, it's not an example. It's um, the, the baronet gave uh, a kind of case where, where uh, this happens, where you find that one event inevit inevitably leads to another. Causal links can sometimes be found in medicine, where an initial health issue can cause a series of steps leading to the death of a patient. So then the doctor can rightly say, hey, don't do such and such because you're going to die, right? Um, but, like, you know, establishing such a causal chain requires such uh, much research and evidence. You can't just willy-nilly claim uh, that A is going to lead to Z. And, and I think that's where, the, uh, that's where the fallacy lies with the slippery slope argument is that you're you're not relying on research and evidence in order to establish that A will inevitably lead to Z. You're just sort of relying on this kind of vague intuition or feeling that A will lead to Z um, rather than uh, research and argument and evidence. So um, in order to establish the, the causal connection, uh, it, it takes a lot of work. Um, okay, so that's it for fallacies of, of weak induction. I hope you enjoyed it.